I want you to do a little exercise with me if you're able to. If you're able to think back that far for some. I want you to think back to your first love. First time you, know, you felt your heart just pounding in your chest for that special someone, that person that you know, if you left them off at their house after you had a date or an outing or something, you couldn't wait to get home and call them up. And you'd talk on the phone and you'd say, okay, good night. Oh, okay, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. Okay, good night. No, you hang up. No, you hang up first. I love you. Yeah, well, I love you too. Yeah, but I really love you. Yeah, but I really, really love you too. You know, that first, that first love, so marvelous. Now you could use all kinds of words you know, to describe the experience. Exhilarating, exciting, scary, intense, confusing, hurtful, joyous, blissful. A lot of words can be used to explain this experience in your life. Regardless of the words used, however, one thing remains the same. It was an experience. You felt something when you began your first uh, serious relationship with another person. Well, I believe the same thing could be said about our relationship with God. It's not a casual thing you know, to be involved with the living God. After all, he sacrificed his son in order to permit a relationship between himself and ourselves. So, you know, he's put a lot into the relationship. He ordered history in such a way to provide the circumstances where we could meet and know and love and develop a close, deep, intimate relationship with Him. He provided a constant presence of Himself in our lives by giving us His word and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to create intimate spiritual bonding between Himself and ourselves. Having a relationship with God is a real experience. It's just not a theoretical thing. You know, it's not just the thing that the preacher talks about from the pulpit. It's a deeply personal, moving experience. It ought to be. It ought to be. It ought to be intense. It ought to be a felt experience. We should be able to describe it just as we can describe our experience with our first love or our present love. And so David, the writer of many of the Psalms, he was especially gifted in this area because he not only was a sensitive and emotional man, he was also a creative man who God was able to use to describe his feelings concerning his relationship with God. We have an example of a man who had a deep experience with God and wrote about it. We don't all have the skill that David had in writing about our experience with God. God referred to David as his friend, demonstrating the level to which their relationship had grown. David was able to describe what it felt like to have a relationship with God and the reason that I pointed you to Psalm number five is because in Psalm number five, he puts into words what going with God, what a relationship with God felt like. And that's the Psalm that I want to examine with you briefly tonight. So the experience of going with God, what is it like? Well, a relationship with God feels exclusive exclusive. In Psalm 5, beginning in verse 1, David says, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. See, this relationship as far as David is concerned, is the only one of its kind. 
There is no room, he says, for any other relationship like this one. As a matter of fact, the first commandment specifies that the only relationship that you can have with God is with Jehovah God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Father to whom Jesus prayed and who Jesus embodied and who Jesus revealed. Our relationship with God's not just any God, it's the God, it's that historical God. And so if you're going to have a relationship with a spiritual being, this is the only one that you can have a relationship with. All others are frauds. All others are simply something that human beings have made up and developed. And so the relationship with God the Father is exclusive and it eliminates um, uh, all other relationships you know, with the dead relatives, uh, martyred saints, angels, spirit beings, mythical gods, so on and so forth. No other gods, no other spirits can come before God the Father, Exodus 20, one and two. It's exclu How does it feel? It feels exclusive. And David demonstrates this in his opening prayer of the day directed towards the Lord. It was the first relationship that he acknowledged each day. It was one that he cherished throughout the day. It was the only spiritual relationship that he actually acknowledged and acknowledged it in his writing. Like all, quote, exclusive relationships, this one is rather demanding and it's scary at first. But as you give in to it and submit totally to it, just like we submit to one another in marriage, well then the relationship grows deeper and more precious as the years go by. And so relationship with God feels exclusive. In other words, it doesn't feel like any other relationship. And that is appropriate because no other relationship is quite like the relationship that we have with God. So how does it feel? It feels exclusive. There's nothing else that quite feels like the relationship we have with God. Secondly, David goes on to say that a relationship with God feels holy, special. Let's read verse four, he says, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, no evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, you hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. You know, remember that one of the benefits of a deep relationship with another person, especially your spouse, is that it tends to make you a better person. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard men say that if it wasn't for their wives and their love for their wives, boy, they would have just gone on to ruin, you know? There, see, you got an amen. This is the only amen line we're going to get tonight, right? <laughs> and I could say amen in the very same way. How many men have said that? Oh, if it wasn't for my wife, she, she saved me. She saved me not like Jesus saves me, but she saved me from myself and saved me from loneliness and saved me from so many things. She made me a better person. She made me want to be a better person, and I've heard how many women, how many women have gone beyond their abilities in sacrificing, sacrificing themselves for a man that they loved? How many women have pulled up roots and moved across the country simply to be with the, the husband and what he was going to do? And how many of them have uh, sacrificed themselves, bearing children and caring for children and so on and so forth? Why? Because they love that man. A relationship with God is like that. It, it provokes us to do better, to try harder, to make an effort at eliminating evil in our lives. The evil that David talks about here in verses four, five, and six that I've just read. God is holy and pure without sin or darkness of any kind. And when we are exposed to Him in a relationship, we want to be like that too. One of the difficulties of Christianity is that the more we begin to know God, the more we begin to understand His character, the deeper our relationship grows with Him, the more we abhor sinfulness. 
the more we despise the sinfulness that we see in our own flesh. It's a terrible you know, dual thing that's going on all the time. I see God and I, I see what I can see of Him in the Word. And the Spirit shows me what I can be in Christ. And when I compare that vision to what's in the mirror, <laughs> wow, there's, there's a difference there. And the pain that I feel, that Christians feel between what they are now and what they want to be because of Christ, many times simply grows. Because we want to do better. People say, you know, oh, you Christians, you think you're perfect. Well, I don't think I'm perfect, but I want to be. I want to be perfect. I desire it with all my heart to be perfect. Why? Because I have a relationship with the perfect one. That's why. And so in any relationship, each partner affects the other. In our relationship with God, our lost and miserable condition moved Him to reach out and to save us. And His holiness and mercy move us to become like Him in purity and in mercy. Well, so far David says that in a relationship with God, one feels exclusivity. One begins to know and understand what holiness is all about in seeing a holy God and wanting holiness for themselves. And then he says, a relationship with God also feels safe. Safe. In verse seven he says, but as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow in reverence for you. You know, one of the most uncomfortable feelings when we are in a relationship with someone is jealousy. We're always afraid that we're going to lose their love to someone else. Sometimes we experience fear, fear that they will die or fear that they will leave us, fear that our relationship will somehow fall apart. There's no room for such feelings in our relationship with God, however. He will never leave us. I mean, if we don't memorize any scripture, we ought to remember the one in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verses five and six. The writer says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, he himself, meaning God himself, has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? You know, one of the things people are afraid of is dying alone. They don't want to be alone when they die. You know, that's why the family rushes to the hospital if the nurse calls and says, you know, we, we think it's almost time. People rush, they want to be there for that moment. And how many times have I seen this happen they're there for hours and hours and then, whoops, you know, bathroom break, or I was just, I'll go down and get a coffee, and they go down and get the coffee, and then when they come back up, the person is gone, and they like, oh no, you know, all this effort, I wanted to be there, I wanted to hold their hand, you know, the last month, because they, they don't want them to be alone. Have you ever realized, we're not alone? The Holy Spirit of God is in the Christian. He or she is never alone, especially at the point of death. There's no, there's no fear of that in our relationship with God. Why? He said, I will never leave you, never. I will never forsake you. It doesn't say, if you're good, if you cross all the T's and dot all the I's, and if you live according to what, you know, if you just live according to what you want to do and if you, you know, if you do good, then maybe I'll do. No, he said, I will never ever forsake you. And then in, in Romans chapter, um, chapter eight, verse 35, he says, I'll never stop 
loving you. In Romans 8, 35, he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tri tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If, 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 you, if you don't take anything away from tonight's lesson, take these two things. God has promised us, His children, Christians, I will never leave you and I will always love you. You don't need to be a theologian, you don't have to be an expert in the Greek language to you know, understand those passages. They're, they're fairly clear. David says you know, to be in God's house, as David was saying here, is to have a relationship with Him. That's what David is talking about. He's not talking about going to church. He's talking about having a relationship with God. A good Jew who went to the temple meant he had a good relationship with God. So to be in God's house is to have a relationship with Him and once you have this relationship, no one will take it away from you. And God will never leave you. You are completely safe. You can leave God, yes. You can walk away from Him and you control that. You're able to say no to him. You're able to say, I don't want to be your friend anymore. I don't love you anymore. I'm walking away from you. You can do that if you want. But he says he will never leave you. He will always love you. Not just on your good days either. Not just on your good days. And then David goes on and finishes up by saying that a relationship with God feels sure, it feels sure. He says in verse eight, O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. There's nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God, by their own devices. Let them fall. In their multitude of their transgression, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. David talks about his relationship with other people here. He's not talking about his relationship with God, he's talking about his relationship with other men, men who deceive, men who are uh, untrustworthy. And he says that there is nothing reliable in what they say. But in a relationship with God, you can trust every single word that he says to be true, to be accurate, to be worthy, to be reliable. You know, one of the marvelous things of studying God's word is that you're studying something which is true, which is perfect. When you learn it, when you know it, you never lose it. It's always there and it's always true. 300 years from now, with this very same text, a preacher will get up and he may say in one language or another, you know, be sure of one thing, God will always love you, God will never forsake you. <laughs> it, it doesn't change, never changes. You know, those who have a relationship with God can know where He stands on all matters and can be sure about the rewards and punishments that He's going to mete out. With Him, you know where you stand. You don't kind of add up stuff and it comes to the wrong conclusion at the end. It's very comforting to have a relationship with someone who can make great promises. I will forgive you for your sins. I will support you. I will raise you up from the dead. I will, I will give you eternal life. It's nice to have a relationship with a person like that who can back it up, who has the power to keep it and has demonstrated that he always, always keeps his word. That's what it feels like to trust God. I'm absolutely sure of him. 
and what He promises. And then finally, one more, a relationship with God, according to David, feels joyful. Verse 11 he says, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy and may you shelter them that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. You know, human relationships always end in death or divorce. I remember a, you know, a counselor saying that once, you know, I was kind of shocked at first, but when you think about it, yeah, all marriages end in death or divorce. There's no other, there isn't another option, okay? No matter how joyful or loving or tender, there are always bitter tears, sooner or later, such is life. A relationship with God is not always easy because there are growing pains in the process of spiritual maturity. However, we always have the joyful knowledge that our relationship with God will continue to build until it is overflowing with joy and happiness that will lead us to heaven. There will be no end to our relationship with God because once it is begun, it is the only relationship that is designed to last forever and the only relationship designed to last forever in a joyful state. Unlike our first love, if you've been blessed with the, the experience that your first love has been your love throughout your entire life, that's all, everybody wants that, not everybody gets that, you know, well good for you. But even that marvelous experience will end in sadness one day. Unlike our relationship with God, it will go on and on. Actually, it will go on and on and get better for us. So my most significant you know, earthly relationship is the one I share with my wife, Lise. And yet she has told me that I will always be second in her life. I'm number two. The Lord, she says, will always be number one in her life. Of course, now that the grandkids have come along, I'm number 11. <laughs> but you know, such is life. <laughs> I I, every time somebody announces they're pregnant, I go down a notch, you know, but you know, it's okay. And of course, this is the way it should be, right? The eternal, the eternal relationship must come first. The temporal relationship comes next. The one with unlimited potential, that comes first, and the one that is limited by sin and death, that one comes second. Our relationship is great because, well, she's second in my life as well, since I too am pursuing as a priority my relationship with God and the benefits that come from it. So let me end up uh, this lesson by just asking a question. And the question, of course, is, are you experiencing the things that I've been talking about in your relationship with God? You know, I mean, what's the point of the sermon? If we don't get around to asking that question. You know, things like intimacy and exclusiveness, a greater personal holiness, a feeling of safety and peace, a sense of complete trust, an anticipation of joy in the future, these are all things you feel. If you are, then praise and thank God for the blessings that you're enjoying in your relationship with Him. Good, great, wonderful, keep going. If you're not, then there may be some very definite reasons why you're not feeling the things that I've talked about. For example, perhaps you know about Him, but you don't have a relationship with Him. You know, I know about uh, George W. Bush, former president. Uh, I've been to his uh, li presidential library and I've read books written by him. And so, so I know about George W. Bush, but he and I are not in a relationship. See what I'm saying? So you can know about God through study and teaching, but in order to enter a relationship with Him, you must come to Him through Jesus Christ. It's like marriage. You can know somebody and you can love somebody, but in order to have the ultimate intimate relationship with them, you need to commit yourself in marriage. 
That's why living together is not like marriage. Is living together a commitment? Yeah, it's a commitment of sort. Is there love there? Sure, there's love there. But it is not the highest form of commitment between a man and a woman. And God demands of us the highest form of commitment, which is marriage between a man and a woman. Now, with God, on the other hand, you need to commit yourself through faith and repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ in order to enter fully into a relationship with Him. A lot of people in the world know about God, but they're not in a relationship with Him because they haven't responded in obedience of the gospel. And so baptism, for example, is, a, is the believer's wedding ceremony that unites them to God in an intimate and an eternal relationship. Maybe that's the reason you don't feel the things that I've talked about. Uh, um, perhaps you've cheated on Him. I mean, you can't have a serious relationship with God if you're playing around with sin, just like you can't have a serious relationship with another person you know, in marriage if you're cheating on them. Now you can cheat on your partner and you can cheat on your friends, but I guarantee you, you cannot cheat on God because He always knows and He always withdraws from you when you are guilty of unrepentant sin. The relationship is exclusive, not perfect. People are weak, people make mistakes, people fall into sin. So in order to maintain a relationship with God, we have to decide who we want to serve and what we want to experience. Do we want to experience a relationship with God or do we want to experience sin? Because sin is an experience too. It gives us something as well. We just have to decide which experience is more important to us. And then finally, perhaps we're not working at the relationship. You know, a relationship with God is similar in many ways to our other human relationships. We have to invest time and effort in order to make them work. We need to communicate to keep it going. And so God communicates with us, how? Well, through the cross of Christ and our blessings and our conscience and the Bible and the Holy Spirit and the church. And we need to keep our lives, our lines of communication open with Him as well. And how do we do that? Oh, through prayer and meditation and worship and study and service and giving. And that's how we communicate with Him. Relationships work both ways. God always works His end. Sometimes we get a little too busy or a little too bad to work our end. One thing is for sure, we all need a relationship with God and we can all have one today. We begin it with faith, expressed in repentance and baptism. We renew it by being restored on a daily basis through prayer or through the prayers of the elders, whatever uh, situation is appropriate, and we refresh it by worship and service and praise. So if you need a relationship with God this evening, or if you'd like to begin a relationship with this church by identifying with us, we invite you to come forward now.